You remember Grandma Samjai in Thailand? She really wants to see you. I said she really wants... I said she really wants to see you. Thanks for talking to me today about your new movie, My Best Worst Adventure. Glad to be here. I love this. I mean, picture this as a pitch. A rebellious American teen is sentenced to a summer in Banglamung, Thailand with her quirky grandmother. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you know, you're a writer, you're a producer. I went to film school. You know, I just, yeah. I just, I love pitches, you know? So, I mean, that just says it all. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounded good coming out of your mouth. I'm glad. <laughs> you know, I, I really enjoyed this film. Coming of age genres is one of my favorites. And this had so much familiarity to it, but also it was just all new to me because of the culture and where we were, you know, and I love the character of, uh, is Lily, right? Not Lily. Yep. Uh, yeah, Lily. Well, Lily's the actress. The uh, actress Jen Jenny is the character. Jenny, that's right. Jenny. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, you know, she's a fish out of water, too. You know, even though she has the same culture, she's a city girl in the country. So she's mm -hmm. it's just a, just a, to see her reaction to all of that and her iPad. You know, it, it's literally an 18th century setting, you know, because they peop, they live a simple life and she brings this technology. And so this movie is just ripe with all kinds of conflict. And, and it's just it's just real well done. And I love the setting. I mean, it's just something I've never seen before. Thank you so much. That that actually makes me happy because uh, that's what we're going for. I mean, it's it's uh, as a guy who's done a lot of horror films and and monster movies to to try something this different, but sort of in the same vein. And if you take a step back from it, because basically this is a young lady from Los Angeles that's landed on a foreign planet, an alien planet with a lot of aliens running around that are are absurd and frightening and endlessly frustrating well she's a rebel you know yeah she, she's a rebel and she meets another rebel in school uh boonrod and this mm -hmm. friendship you know rebels attract right so this friendship blossoms um you know and they both refuse to speak so there's almost a silent movie quality to this movie very deliberately yes which is difficult you know for an actress to have well, a main character who doesn't speak. I mean, that's that's kind of uh, challenging, isn't it? Well, I guess this was sort of a suicide mission in a way because, you know, first you start off with kids and animals in a foreign country, you don't speak the language, and then you go ahead and top that off by hiring an actress who has never acted a day in her life, even in a high school play, that she just wowed me by virtue of who she was. She was this kind of truant kid who, um, um, skipped school one day and wandered by an audition and said, hmm, you know, I'll check it out. You've and been, <laughs> you've been in Hollywood for her. a long time, Joel. You're never supposed to work with animals or children. And here you're breaking the golden rule with both, right? <laughs> well, the rule is if you're going to go down, go down bigly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I love how you know, we're in the countryside, but I love their getaway to town. The music, the kickboxing, the tug of war, you know, there's this, because in the country you feel so isolated and then when they go to right. town, you feel this burst of energy and culture and color and it just kind of gives the film a jolt in the arm at that point. Well, I felt the same thing as, as a filmmaker because we're all marooned essentially in this very rustic and, you know, I don't want to call it backward because it's, it's, 
it has so many forward qualities that we could all learn from, but it's obviously technologically far removed from anything you would see in a first world uh, setting. And um, that was deliberate. I wanted her basically in a, in a, like I said, in an alien world that she was utterly unfamiliar with, but then the joy of going into a city and, and participating in the, the, the pageantry of a festival and the, the whole, you know, the experience of that culture, it, it's, it's infectious. You know, it was for me, it's for it in some ways for the character and story. And it's, you know, it's, it is about sort of bridging cultural divides and, and seeing some other way of life that's valid. Right. And, you know, you can say they're backwards in terms of technology, but when it comes to universal emotions and relationships, I mean, you know, from a broken home, from a grandmother and a daughter connecting, a, a, a daughter trying to find her mother's past, those are all universal truths that anyone can identify with anywhere. They are. And, and you picked up on right away the whole idea of trying to explore that in what is essentially a silent film. And um, I, yeah, I'm a big fan of silent films. Uh, I just, I think they sort of embodied what film was all about initially, which is it's a visual medium and you sort of uh, add dialogue uh, to, to spice it, but it shouldn't overcome the, the pleasure of sitting back and watching people feel and emote. I, when I went to film school, I remember my film professor one year said, you should be able to turn the sound down on a movie and watch the entire thing and understand what's going on. And I'll never forget that. That actually happened to me in a film that I directed in Romania. It was one of the prophecy series. And um, it was uh, another case of cu cultural immersion where I realized I can't tell an American story here. It's just too vastly different. This was Romania right before, right after the fall of communism. And it was in, in virtual economic ruin. And so I embraced that and put it into the movie and had all the actors that we hired in Romania, they speak their own language. And I subtitled it, but the subtitles fell off of the movie somehow when it went out to DVD. And so half the movie is people speaking Romanian and there's not a word underneath to know what, the, what it is they're saying. And I was livid. I mean, I, I thought I'd been utterly betrayed by the studio. It was, it was a colossal mistake. But one of, one of the, the executives who was, I don't think necessarily trying to make excuses, but he said, look, just watch the film and tell me how, how badly this, this mistake has cost you. And it taught me this huge lesson because I'm watching the story and I'm losing nothing from the fact that they're talking, you know, like the parents in a Peanuts move, uh, cartoon, you know, <laughs> it's, it didn't matter because it's all about if you've, if you've shown the story and you've shown the reactions to the events in that story, you're telling it properly. And from a filmmaker's point of view, the movie moves fast when you don't have to worry about blocking for dialogue, right? You're just getting a reaction from exactly. something. Exactly. So this, you just, you were getting your shot list done pretty good, I'm sure. Yeah, and so it, it's both economic behind the camera and, and also in the finished product. And, and I've sort of carried that lesson of making movies in foreign languages and in foreign places that, because I'm an American and, and my, my audience is fellow Americans for the most part and around the world, obviously, as much as we can. But um, I never set out to make a foreign movie. I set out to make a universal one that language doesn't matter. And uh, that was sort of the key behind this one. Well, you know, I've heard of running with the bulls, but uh, Buffalo racing, is that a favorite pastime in Thailand? Because that was something, that was the most unusual thing I've ever seen. And the way you staged that, you made it pretty exciting. <laughs> it's what initially drew, drew me to the story. I mean, the it, I was actually in Bangkok doing a little thriller and the producer of that film, a delightful woman named Charyuan Tavoranan, um, was telling me just a, one day about her own childhood growing up in, in the north of, of Thailand near the Cambodian border and, and how they did exactly that as kids. They would round up a dozen um, steers, uh, buffalo, um, and race them. And they race them. It's just basically riding a stampede. 
and uh, you just hang on for dear life. And of course, the first one across the finish line wins. Um, but if you fall off, and most of them do, uh, you have a very good chance of getting trampled. Um, and, you know, <laughs> I, I guess tell that to skateboarders these days who say like, yeah, what? So, so there's a little risk, who cares? Right. Um, but it fascinated me because that was a sport I'd never heard about. And it actually is big in not only Thailand, but Southeast Asia. They actually have huge national tournaments where the, 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 the best of the, of, of the sport are rock stars. I mean, huge. Yeah, because watching, you know, Boonrod riding Sam Ali, it was, <laughs> it was almost a Black Stallion quality to it. <laughs> well, that's, that's yeah. what intrigued me, was sort of pulling the spirit of those movies, like the Black Stallion and Seabiscuit and National Velvet and all those, where horses were the, 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 the focus. And this is, to me, just flipping that a little bit, keeping that spirit and that love of the animal and, and how that relationship ultimately benefits both well you know as a filmmaker you sound like you're pretty experienced in southeast asia what was the challenges shooting in thailand though um technologically uh we didn't have as much to work with from the from an equipment standpoint but i had a dp a director of photography who was so gifted that um and this is what i admire about other cultures and what essentially makes them in a way smarter than us, because we have all the toys that can do everything. They have to figure it out. And this guy, we had a complex dolly move um, through a very tight situation. This guy had um, laid down a kind of a dolly track that he, he balanced with, uh, leveled out with, with paperback books because they didn't have anything else to do it with. Um, and... Uh, he was his own dolly grip, his own focus puller, and his own cameraman. And he's like locomoting this dolly with one foot on the ground as he's pushing it along, trying to keep it smooth and in focus and in frame. And it was a beautiful shot. <laughs> and, you know, nobody in, in, in the US or most anywhere in the first world would have even attempted it, attempted it because it's absurd. Well, when I made eight millimeter films when I was a teenager, you know, back in the 80s, we would take a wheelchair with two planks of wood to do a dolly shot and we would hold the camera and someone pushed me in a wheelchair. That's that's <laughs> those are the best know, shots I ever. Love, I love those stories because we, we forget about that, that, that we did. We did improvise and make things, um, you know, that were kind of special in, in their day. So. Um, so that was sort of a full circle experience for me as well. It's coming back to that kind of, you know, make it up as you go along technology. Well, you know, your movie was so immersive. I felt like I was right there in Thailand. That's what I, that's what I noticed. And the incredible vistas and the, and the, it was just gorgeous to look at, you know, mm -hmm. let alone from the story. But I swear, Joel, I'm telling you, Go back and look at it. When Jenny's in class and is called up front to point at the map, she's pointing to Las Vegas. I looked at that scene. It, when she takes that pointer, it looks like she's pointing to Las Vegas. That's Southern Nevada. All right. Well, that was, I'm glad you picked up on that because I'm going to say that was a subtle dig at our educational system here in the United States. <laughs> the well, geography is, is vastly under underutilized as a, as a teaching topic. Because <laughs> I'm like, she went up and went right. To, I go, oh, man. <laughs> That's, that's good karma. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, all right, now that you've mentioned that, before we, we uh, go out in full release, I'm going to uh, rewrite the story that she's from Las Vegas. That would be awesome, yeah. <laughs> we have. Well, you know, Joel, thank you for joining me today. What a wonderful coming-of-age film. I'm so happy for you. You know, you give me a, a, a good lift for my weekend. Oh, and, great, uh, Jeffrey. That makes me super happy. And also, I'm a big fan. You know, I, I've looked at your resume, man. I've seen all those films, you know, all your prophecies <laughs> and Children of the Corn and all that stuff. So I'm a big horror fan. So I wanted to thank you for all what you've done for that genre, too. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right. Take care and good luck with the film. You too.